So, Ashley, could you just introduce yourself? Um, yeah, just your name and just tell me about yourself. Um, yeah, so my name is Ashley Grant. I am currently a senior here at Penn State University. I'm an adult learner, so um, I went to college once and then came back for the second time to actually finish my undergrad. Um, my focus is telecommunications and international media. And yeah. Mm -hmm. um, can you tell me about where and when you were born? Um, I was born in Texas. Um, my year is 1994. And, um, but I was raised like all over the place because I grew up in the system. Mm -hmm. So, and my mom had me young. So I was born in Texas, but then I was like raised in like Oklahoma, Los Angeles, Pennsylvania area. Mm -hmm. Um, could you describe your, I guess, adolescent experiences in those different areas? Um, so like my teen years? Yeah. Um, so my teen years were, were the years that I was in and out of most the houses. Like, mm -hmm. that was my most um, unstable time. But, like, overall, I lived in um, Pennsylvania for most of that time. Mm -hmm. It was like a culture shock because most of my time I remember was like very diverse and then I moved to Pennsylvania, um, like state college area and it wasn't like diverse and then I went even deeper into the state of um, Pennsylvania which was like more rural and then it like absolutely wasn't diverse and that's when I was like a teenager, like high school, mm. identify yourself type age. Mm. How was your high school experience in terms of like, because I know you said it wasn't as diverse, so what, did you have any experiences that really amplified that for you? Um, well, the first thing was the whole school was K through 12, mm -hmm. and like I was the only black or African American mixed um, student there from like K through 12. So that was already like a hit or miss because um, I like looked different. Um, so that was the focus of like getting through high school was just like the looking different. Mm -hmm. um, what can you remember about the, I guess, cause like everyone, I wouldn't say everyone, but a lot of people have memories tied to like getting their hair done either by like a family member or going to a salon or mm -hmm. trying to learn how to do it yourself. Um, so how, what was that experience like for you? Um, when I was a kid, um, before I entered the system, my mom used to do my hair, so it was very much like hair done the night before pictures or um, every other Sunday before school week. Um, a lot of like sitting in between your mom, getting like yelled at about staying still, watching whatever family show, kids are running around. Um, and then those styles were very much just like braids or I would like get cornrows and then crochet, which is like a kind of like um, basically exactly how it sounds like a crochet, you crochet braids into your head, your, your braids. Mm -hmm. um, so that was as a kid. And then as a teenager, when I left the home, it was more like figure it out, kind of like YouTube. Um, that's where I really found like, not my culture, but like my identity for my hair because growing up, our head was like our crown as far as like, it makes your whole outfit when your hair is not done. Um, my mom was very much not one of those people to like send us out anywhere without our hair done or without it even being like a slick ponytail or like something. Mm -hmm. um, so I've always had that in my head. So growing up in the system, I was around a white family and they didn't know anything about me or black hair. Um, so I had to look into it, like research different people on YouTube, um, ask for like different styles and um, conditioners and stuff. But now as an adult, because of the maintain that I've always had in my head, mm -hmm. I know how to do hair, but it takes a lot of time. So I spend a lot of time at salons. Um, I make different friends with different fr um, people who know how to do braids and like the styles I like. Mm -hmm. And I have a different style like every, I don't know, I would say like four to six weeks and I never do the same style different. So that's just becoming my identity of like always something different or always a different color or always some type of different style because <clears throat> growing up, I did so many different styles, trying yeah. to keep up with that like 
your hair is your crown. Don't go outside looking crazy. Mm-hmm. So, yeah. Definitely. What you said about, like, um, like now that you're in a financially stable space where you can, like, pay for services, I was mm-hmm. thinking, like, if there's a way that I can pay for a service, I'm going to pay for it rather than just, like... Do it myself. Yeah, because, like... Yeah, and that even takes time, right? Because mm-hmm. you can't trust everybody with your head. And I know some people believe in, like, chemicals and stuff like that. I'm more of a, like, natural kind of no heat. I do more braids and, like, long-term protective styles than relaxers and stuff like that. Mm-hmm. But even with that, you kind of have to trust that person so they don't mess up. Yeah. Mess definitely. up your vibe. Yeah. <laughs> Exactly. <laughs> or just mess up your hair in general. Yeah. Like, I got my hair braided once at, like, this random African shop, and it was, like, really good, but then my hair fell out, mm-hmm. like, and now it has to Because they do it back. too tight? Yeah. Yeah, it's so, insane. Yeah. So, it's a delicate process, for sure. <laughs> Very sensitive. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, so, you did mention, like, this concept of, like, always having to be done or, like, mm-hmm. presentable or have your hair be presentable in a way. Um, so could you more, maybe explain more about your feelings of surrounding that either positive or negative? Um, so ideally, ideally I have mixed feelings about it because I am very much a, um, presentation type of person where like how you look different places is how people speak to you. But I'm not one of those people like who care what I look like at a grocery store or Walmart. Mm -hmm. Um, more like or even school, really, like if it's a regular Monday through Friday kind of day. Yeah. Um, it would be more for like church or pictures or a big event that I personally am big heavy on it. Mm-hmm. Um, my mom or my family was under the impression of like, gotta stay nice because <clears throat> she tried to like upkeep our lifestyles in a certain area or way, right? So like not living in the hood and like trying to just live in a category that she didn't want to be identified in as her youth. Mm -hmm. So that's why it was so pertinent to her to make sure we look nice because there was always somebody else who had something to say to her or she felt judged. Mm -hmm. And so I feel like that connotation is negative because she would pressure herself to get three kids' heads ready however often, constantly. Mm -hmm. And of course we didn't have money to like send you to the salon so she just learned how to master different styles. Um... So that's beautiful in the sense of you look back and you're like, oh, I remember every other Sunday we would sit down and head by head. And then it's stressful because it's like, yo, she cared so much about little stuff. Like when we would like go outside, you know, lick your edges down and like make sure. Um, But I have a son myself and he has hair. He grows his hair out. And there's actually days where like he goes to school with like last week's twists and dreads or locks or whatever. um, Just because like he's a kid and... The stress of keeping it uptight is just too much for me. And so if my mom lived with us or lived near, she wouldn't have it. She would probably have him still at her house every other Sunday. Mm -hmm. But my son definitely gets the prep and press right before his picture day, right before everything else. So yeah, it's hit or miss. I'm super stressful and on him, like, wrap your hair up. Do not look crazy for tomorrow's picture. Um, But on that Wednesday morning at school, it's like, can you just wrap it in a tighter ponytail or can you like throw some water on it? Okay, yeah. cool. <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> Especially just trying to get kids' hairs done in general is always a battle. Like, Yeah, he fights with me. Literally, he fights with me so much about sitting down, but then he feels good when it's done. And yeah. it's so funny because he'll be like, no, nah, I don't need my hair done. And it's looking like J. Cole, you know, like yeah. how J. Cole's hair is right now. <laughs> Where it's like his style and it looks good for him, but like, the school will call me like, um, so do you need hair conditioner? Yeah. <laughs> um, so, but then when he sits down and you give him his iPad or his snack and you set him up for like the three hours we're going to be sitting, mm-hmm. um, then he like gets up, you know, that smile, that like confidence. Yeah. So that makes me keep a maintain to where we're not like nappy and knotted. Right. Yeah. Um, there, there's a process. It's not head over heels, but you don't want to let it go. Yeah, <laughs> absolutely. <laughs> um, so. Yeah. Um, so we're going to shift a little more into, like, the mental health aspect of it. Mm-hmm. Um, so what, I guess, growing up, um, 
either within your own personal community or spaces, what was the idea or sentiment surrounding mental health? Um, either, yeah, probably during your youth or something like that. So. Oh, man. I mean, mental health wasn't even a thing until, like, now for me. Mm-hmm. If I, like, really look back on it, as far as being able to, like, openly talk about it, um, as a kid, mental health didn't exist. It was more like... It wasn't even more like anything. You just didn't talk about it. It just, when you went crazy or when you were upset, you were just upset. It wasn't really like a depression or like a mental health anxiety or anything like that. And then when families were going through death or depression or anything of that sort, it was kind of like a, what happens in the home stays in the home. So you weren't really like looking to get help or being allowed to talk about it. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah. So that was as a kid. I feel like we didn't really start recognizing mental health, even in our family, until I was a teenager. And that's just because my mom took time to, like, get therapy for other reasons that, like, helped her identify different traumas and different things for her. So seeing, as you know, I was in foster care, as I said earlier. So, like, seeing how that's made her grow. Mm -hmm. It made us more comfortable to talk about, okay, what was that? Oh, that was anxiety. Oh, you were having, like, a blackout moment of, like, I can't handle life. And you, like, make that okay so that other people can process it. Um, like, our father's crying or our brother's crying. Like, that wasn't allowed. Mm-hmm. Like, acting like a girl or uh, whatever the sentiment or statement would be. So you can just see now, like, me being at the age where I see mental health coming so much and coming from a place where we didn't have it at all. You can see like the men specifically, or even mothers and women who like, after they accept it or know that that's a thing, they like feel more free in a sense. Like men I feel like are so aggressive and so they know they can feel that emotion Mm -hmm. and then helping guide them through makes them like a better person. Um, In my family, we have a lot of males that are like aggressive or abusive or um, very quick to anger. And it's almost like you want to shun them out because, like, they're those things. But then when you look, you think about their, like, life trauma and, like, that kind of stuff. And, yeah, you could just see the difference. So me being right at that bracket of, like, mental health is a thing and, like, shh, there's no mental health. It's, like, there is. Yeah. (laughs) (laughs) Definitely. (laughs) So. I guess when thinking about just personal perception, Mm -hmm. um, especially when it comes to, like, femininity within the black community Mm -hmm. um how does that I guess transpire into your own viewpoint of it like when you hear the words like femininity or black femininity specifically like how does that or what does that bring to mind um so for me it's like two-sided because I feel like it's a great thing that our black women are being more vocal and recognized in their hard work and strides as far as like making a name for themselves or not sitting under a bigger brand or um you know under a corporation or whatever the entrepreneurs and the different things happen look like but i also think it's like annoying just overall in society that it keeps on having to be like a a racial cultural division of like first black woman first indian woman first white like whatever Because us black women, I feel, compete against each other. I feel like there's not enough success that's just there naturally. You know, just just Hillary Clinton or just whoever the other successful, you know, common names are. Mm -hmm. And so when we're fighting for, like, that directorship amongst, like, a me and you, Mm -hmm. we're more going against each other than supporting each other. And I feel like that's where my issue of, like, that comes in where we're like, um, like your examples, whatever your couple examples are. I'm like, yeah, so we gave her that title, but that person coming under now feels competitive, competitive against, or she's the first black woman to do it, but that girl was right there so close or something, yeah. right? So instead of saying like the first black woman or da, 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 it becomes so idolized mm-hmm. because it is a great achievement, but I don't know. I feel like I see more culture supporting each other just on an everyday basis that us titling our successes makes us fight each other and we're already we're already going through so much fighting each other 
Mm-hmm. And now our success and our titles is like also in the way of each other. Mm-hmm. But that's far, probably far and beyond what you wanted. But yeah. that's just <laughs> what I see when I keep seeing the titling like that. Mm-hmm. It's like it's super great because we're getting there. Any first bad art entrepreneur in Canada? But then I just feel like it just makes our culture fight each other more. We're not so supportive because there's only two spots at that. Um, uh, you know how you have to have a certain amount of this kind of uh, race, mm-hmm. whatever that's called. Yeah. So there's only like two seats in the black section, right? Because you already have all the white. You maybe have the Asian. You might be missing like a, a Hispanic or something. But you already have those two seats for the black. So like, there's nothing else, right? It's not just like an overall. If you have these achievements, you're there, and you're just filling it. They're going by like a status quo and like certain numbers and groups. So mm-hmm. while we still have that. It means nothing to me. I just feel like I'm always going to have to keep striving. Yeah. Why do you uh, think that we always have this competition? Because there's that. We have, like, when you talked about, like, accomplishments and being, like, the first to do whatever in the media. But then also there's, like, colorism or texturism or, like, internal sexism within the black community. So why do you think we still have those um, conflicts regardless of our history? Um, I think it's because of society's category, Mm -hmm. right? You break down, it naturally breaks down in entertainment and media and advertisement and social life of like financial bracket or even the colorism bracket or they'll compare like a Taraji P. Henson to a Halle Berry or a Halle Berry to Sine Lathan or, you know, and those are all different colored texture, tone, women that like Taraji did horrible in that and you should have put somebody, somebody in. So it's like instead of congratulating that, it's like going against. So I don't know why we do it, but I feel like, um, I don't know, that's just what it is. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I think we're like forced to do that because of how like, and it's not even society, but it's like the bigger people Right, because they're really the ones spinning the wheel, and we're just all trying to find our like. Mm-hmm. I don't know. That's how life is to me. We're all racing to that big sweet seat. Yeah. And sometimes it's it's already colored, so you're looking at each other and you're like, okay, I have a chance. You have a less chance. Let's instead of like let's support each other, right? Mm-hmm. Definitely. And it's unsaid. Black people are more like Black Lives Matter to each other. But when me and you are sitting at that same seat for that same director position, it becomes like, well, she came from a this, or she did that, or she didn't get her PhD in this, or it becomes nitpick. Mm-hmm. And I just, I hate to see that. Um, that's why in my goals and my success, I don't see myself like climbing up a ladder. I kind of just see myself doing this like free for all, freestyle, freelance. Because mm-hmm. I don't like to be in competition. Definitely. That makes sense. Um, I know like, within your, because you also filled out the survey, Mm -hmm. um, and one of the questions was regarding, like, the idea of the strong, independent black woman or girl boss, Mm -hmm. and I think yours was, like, saying how it was kind of more empowering, in Mm -hmm. a way, rather than discrediting. Um, Could you explain a little bit more of that, like, how you see the terms as, like, more More empowering? Yeah. Um, Yeah, I see, like, in an empowering way because you have so many positions that you didn't know existed and things like TikTok or Facebook or even the entertainment media Mm -hmm. show those girls doing it, right? Like, And so little girls, younger girls can look up to that. Um, As we said before, there's not a lot of black women in those certain seats and those who did get it, those that were neck and neck and she got that extra point and got there. There's girls looking at that and seeing what they can do to do that, to resemble that to copy that to do better than that and I think that's what it's all about and it's like the better than and the whatever in a competitive way but not really because like if I look up to my mentor I'm not trying to be better than her but she's teaching me all these skills and tools that by the time I'm there you know like generations and whatever so I'll have so much knowledge that you're not better than but you can hold that position or seat just as good as her if not better because now you're fresh with the knowledge yeah um so I like it because you see those women, those lawyers who now own a whole law firm or something like that, and you see the justice system being so wide evolved of like 
you know, the prejudice and all the racism and stuff like that. So to see, like, black women get in power, own their own law firm, become a doctor, become that, like, head surgeon of their department, things like that, or even, like, own their own business now so they're not answering to somebody else, for me, that's empowering because, like I said, I don't like <clears throat> competition, but I do like to see us all doing what we want to do and being successful at it. So that's why it's empowering to me. On the same front side, it's like annoying because those people doing it are like biting teeth. Yeah. But for me, I'm looking at it like, oh my God, it's powerful. So I can pick up my girls and I'm one, like five of us are going, right? I'm not just like me and like kicking them at the, at the ladder. Yeah. So that's my only reply. How do you, um, I guess within your own support system in your own community, how are you able to, um, I guess, uplift other black women um, or how do you uplift, uplift each other through different situations? Um, I think my biggest thing is I have a big circle of like women who come from different backgrounds as far as like mothering or just lifestyles. Mm -hmm. And so us just having that space of like a vent of like, oh, I hate this, and like, yeah, there's people who have it worse, but F this today mm -hmm. helps, you know, get things processed and out. Like we were saying earlier, you like bottling those feelings up. So lately I just like smile at black women, you know, more in the hallways or smiling, because I already naturally have an RBF, and I'm actually really cool behind the RBF. <laughs> so um, I think it's just me doing my part as far as like, smiling a little more and then they smile and they're like oh well I like your shoes and oh I got it from and oh well let's go to lunch and talk you know so like yeah. that one smile makes a whole difference um so I just try to find like my part in it and see like where I can uplift more people um just as like a single mother and student I'm already kind of a role model of others so I try to like play within that and um just let people know they can always have somebody to come to because mm -hmm. this college life gets hectic and when you feel needed and like under a rock, it just can become detrimental. And one decision can make a whole life future change. Yeah. And I just want to try to be that barrier for people. Definitely. Um, I guess I just have a couple more questions left. Um, so I guess when, cause earlier we talked about like, when we talked about the conversation of having your hair done or being presentable, mm -hmm. um, that also is pertinent in the workplace as well. So have you ever felt like, um, I guess what changes or adaptations do you think you've had to do either regarding your hair or just mannerisms when entering into the workplace or like any type of professional setting? Um, as far as like my hair, oh my God, girl. I could like, you could interview me a whole nother time about how many people I've had to cuss out behind my hair. But the general sense, there's like three different brackets of it. It's like mm, me just being me and like showing a color or doing something not crazy, but like colorful mm -hmm. um, and understanding that those jobs at the time don't care. So you can kind of get away with that, right? Like you work at a bar or yeah. something more fun and like festive, That that's fine. And then in my life where I'm like, moving forward and like okay we're not doing the blonde the like bright oranges and bright yellows and pinks but we're doing more like red maroon brown you know a honey blonde or something like that so I work at the hospital now and it's more of a sophisticated more professional lifestyle but I'm also not going to stop like how I show my hair mm -hmm. so for a while like locks was a problem and it wasn't necessarily a problem that they were like, you have to go home and change your hair. But more of a problem, like, you could just feel the different energy. But they've had to understand that, like, I'm going to change my hair out. But I've had to respect the fact that, like, I can't do crazy colors, right? So, like, in their policy, it's natural colors. Mm -hmm. Like, you keep natural colors. But then there's, like, ENTs and nurses and stuff who have, like, purple undercuts and da 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 and they're like a different race than me. So I'm like, why is that okay? Cause she's like that rocker chick, mm -hmm. but I'm here mellow. I just have like pink in my hair or something. Yeah. So those kind of conversations do not really never get anywhere because at the end of the day, the book is by the book and like 
you can't now be sitting in detention and like, well, she's doing it over there because I've just never been there. Yeah. But you can sense the energy. You see that it's still a problem even in 2024. Um, or even there's the annoying shit. This is the other bracket where I get different styles and people like aren't maze, right? So if I wear my natural hair and it's like curly to my shoulders, like, oh my God, your hair grew. Like, how did it grow? Or blah, 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 blah. Or where they like reach to touch my hair. First of all, I'm not even a reacher to touch. Like, there's that weird shit where, or weird stuff where people um, touch bellies, like at grocery stores because people are pregnant or come touch your hair because it's like a different type. That's just weird to me in general. I've been pregnant. I've had pregnant parents, and there was never a time where I'm like rushing to rub their stomach mm-hmm. or letting people do mine. So um, at work, there are the groups of friends who are completely naive and not in a racist sense of like, hey, your hair was just purple, or I really like the mix of color, or like, how long did it take, or like, that kind of thing. Mm -hmm. So I just had to understand that because I get my hair done so consistently and so different, that that's just what comes with it, right? They're gonna ask, hey, how'd you go from locks to braids overnight? Like, you just had that style yesterday. So whoever sees me at work today, whether I take this out or not, (laughs) and they're gonna see me on Thursday night at work, like. Completely different, but I kind of like it. Yeah. Keeps them, keeps them fun. Yeah. <laughs> it's always nice to just, like, do different styles and be like, yeah, I can do whatever I want, actually. Mm-hmm. Like, if it I gives me like the idea to see what I look like in a color without doing it, mm-hmm. without messing up my own hair. So, like, when I do, like, bobs and stuff, I'm like, how would I look short? Or you do, like, a pixie wig, and it's like, how do I look bald? Yeah. But I'm not really bald. <laughs> It's just so dope. I actually support everybody doing it, you know? Just change your hair up every once in a while. Why not? Why not? Mm-hmm. Just do, like, even just get, like, a cheap Cardi C wig. Yeah. In the mirror. Mm-hmm. Hang out. Jam out with the karaoke. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> You'll never get that time back. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, let me think. I think I'll just ask you two questions left. Mm-hmm. So, um, thinking about your overall experience, um, as identifying as a black woman with your own hair, um, do you feel proud of your black identity or have there ever been times where you felt, I guess, ashamed? I don't know if ashamed is the word or just like kind of longing to be more like everyone else kind of way. Um, Because I know like personally sometimes when I was, especially younger, um, I would always wish that I was like, oh, I wish I had like the hair where I can just brush it and put it in a ponytail and blah, blah, blah. So, mm-hmm. yeah. Um, there's a little bit of mix for that. Um, it's never like a, oh my gosh, I can't wear my hair out like this mm-hmm. anymore, right? Because like I said, my mom used to be like, girl, what are, you look, what are you looking like that? And it wasn't even crazy. It was just like a little frizzy and needed some gel. Yeah. So for a little while, when I went from transitioning styles from like one braid to like not getting my hair done for a little couple days, it would be like always wearing a wrap or like covering my hair. Mm-hmm. Um, that's like as I grew up and like going to the rural schools and not wanting them to like see how short my hair was because it wasn't like as long as the blondes and as curly as the brunettes and whatever that may be. Um, but now I I just give it all flavors, you know. Um, mm-hmm. Some days. And it's not even like a mental health. I really just call it like a self-love week yeah. where like my scalp is like breathing. There's like nothing else in it. That's just like fro curly style. We just like wake up and go, you know, mm-hmm. spray some water and call it a day. It might look completely different those days. So those days I recognize that those aren't like my best days. Um, but then in another sense they are because I can like scratch my scalp and like... Mm-hmm. You know, like little things. It's like when I wear makeup or something and you can't rub your face because you have eyeliner and mascara on. Yeah. But then when that face is clear, you're like, oh my God, I can literally like, <laughs> okay, yeah, yes, I can touch me. Yeah. So I enjoy those moments, but um, they don't last long. There's only like a two or three day interval before the next style's in. Yeah. And that's just because it's a happiness for me. It's not necessarily a... And it's also easier. I feel like I have to do way more when my hair is out. Yeah. When my hair is done, I can really wake up and go. And the way my life is, I need to wake up and go. Mm -hmm. So if I have like a long weekend, I'll take my braids out and chill. But then before that busy week, there's definitely another style back in my head. Definitely. Mm -hmm. Because I know a lot of people when like the natural 
um, wave was starting to come up again. Mm -hmm. Like, people trying to figure out, like, how much and how intensive a wash and go really is. Yes. And how it's not a wash. The TWA and stuff. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, and it's, like, a whole thing. Like, you got to do the conditioner and do the flip and do the and do the curl rods the night before. and Yeah. Yeah. Um, Nothing wash and go about it at all. Nothing. <laughs> So then that's where you, like, want girls to feel comfortable that, like, okay, you did all that. You can just wrap it up in a ponytail and still look fine. Yeah. It's just people, I feel like where the line goes is where you're, like, not washing it, not maintaining yeah. it, and trying to use that as a, this is my core, this is what I, mm -hmm. which is still fine. Yeah. That's where I would then bring judgment or, like, my own, like, no, 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 because I do my hair different, and I'll go from locks to, and I see the difference, but that is, <laughs> you have like one lock yeah. that has crust from last year's last year. <laughs> exactly. So, yeah. That's fair. <laughs> Valid. <laughs> <laughs> um, my final question is, how do you think that, um, I guess, black women can begin to uplift or become better role models for younger black girls as we go into the future? Um, I think they're doing a good job of like Jada Pickett shaving her head and making that like a fine thing. Taraji P. Henson cut her hair, I think, and started short and then did her long. Um, just stuff like that where long hair don't care isn't always goals. Mm -hmm. um, I feel like a lot of women, any, any race, but especially our black women who we want to uplift, are beautiful in a lot of different shades of hair and tone and length and curl and whatever. Um, so seeing so many different women rock out with that big fro and look gorgeous doing it or come through with the braids and, like, you know, it just gives girls the, the know that, like, I'm so beautiful with my hair. There's, like, the India Ari, I Am Not My Hair song. Mm -hmm. um, I used to listen to that the whole time, and it was during the process of me, like, beating myself up about not straightening my hair or not being able to do that style, um, mm -hmm. like, in high school. So I think that's ideal. Like every girl needs to listen to that song and then just like feel how they feel mm -hmm. and then like empower over that because like we are our hair and yes, it's our crown and I do emphasize that very much so, but to overstress looking like someone else is where I think the line should be drawn. Yeah. For sure. Is there anything else that you want to talk about or you feel like? I don't know. But I do like this project. It was super cool to talk about. Yeah. Yay, I'm glad. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. You're oh, welcome. Oh.